There it goes. Okay. Well, all right. Good morning. Day two. Here we go. This session is called Keeping Secrets, and it is about uh, basically encryption. How to uh, take some piece of data that you want to use in your script and, you know, have authorized users be able to, to make use of but not have uh, Lee or Joe or Matt Graber or somebody like that steal your stuff. So, a uh, little bit about me. My name is Dave Wyatt. I'm an ops engineer for DevOps Guys. Uh, I've been a PowerShell MVP and uh, on the board of directors for PowerShell.org for about a year now. And uh, I wrote one of the modules that we'll be talking about here today called Protected Data. And what we'll talk about today is, um, well, what we need to distinguish first is uh, the d distinction between different use cases. I've, I've seen two different questions that people tend to ask when they talk about secret data. One is, if somebody who's authorized to run your script is okay with knowing the secret, um, so maybe you're protecting your own credentials or an API key for you know GitHub or PowerShell GET or something like that, and you're okay with yourself knowing the secret, you just wanna make sure that anybody else who looks at your code or your data files or whatever can't steal it. And the other use case that I see a lot of is, I want to distribute a script to my users, have it do something as an administrator, but not let the users know what that credential is. This talk is not really going to help you very much with that second scenario. Um, what you have for that, what you need to do to make that happen is you have to store, decrypt, and use that secret somewhere else, not running as that user account. Because by definition, if your script has everything that it needs to decrypt the value, then so does the user. And if they want to, they can take it. Um, so for that, you have some really convenient things already built in. You've got your uh, custom PowerShell remoting endpoints that you can set up to run as another user uh, on another system, and you've got the GIA module to make it nice and easy to set that up with a CSV file. So what you can use from this talk are the techniques that we're going to talk about on your remoting endpoint. So to store the, the secret value securely, um, but just the important part is that the decryption and the use of the secret takes place somewhere else so that the user never gets to see it. Um, in the course of talking about these different techniques for, for storing and uh, encrypting values, we'll go over some of the like crypto 101 concepts from a, a developer's point of view. So I know me personally, when I came into this topic about a year and a half ago, I I had a familiarity with crypto from a, like an administrator's point of view, so I knew how to spin up a certificate authority and sort of the, the conceptual differences between symmetric and asymmetric encryption and how certificates worked, but it was, it was a pretty big leap to go from that to knowing how to actually write code that uses those properly. Uh, it's, it's very easy to screw up. So with that, just like yesterday, I hate PowerPoint, so goodbye PowerPoint. Do to do what is going on? Oh, it did not automatically switch back. Hang on. Duplicate. There we go. All right, and may the demo god smile on me because I'm going to be typing all this stuff live. So, when you see examples, people asking, "How do I store, say, a credential or a secure string? You know, a password, something secret." Well, first of all, secure strings and PS credential objects are going to be one of the first things you hear about. And those are great. They protect the value in memory. So it's not stored as a simple string object. Um, somebody who manages to, to get a memory dump or whatever won't find your stuff in plain text. However, you need to be able to persist those to disk. And the, the secure strings by themselves don't do that. Now, PowerShell, since maybe even version 1, I'm not sure, but certainly since v2, Convert to and convert from? I thought. Oh, sorry, I thought you were going next part. <laughs> um, they, they've had commandlets called uh, convert to secure string and convert from secure string, I think since v2. Um, and those allow you to take your secure string value in memory, produce an encrypted representation of it in a string form that you can then convert back later. So I'll demonstrate this real quick. I'm going to say, um, I'm going to just make a credential object, get dread. That's different. All right, then we'll say my username, some super secret value. There we go. Now I've got a, a function in my profile here that allows me to take a um, oops, that password, um, a secure string, and show me what's in it. Just it makes it easier to verify that things are happening here. So there's my password. 
it's in a PS credential object, fantastic. Now, the convert from secure string commandlet, if I say uh, SS encrypted equals If you use it like this, with no other parameters, you just pass in this, and what you get is this nice encrypted blob of coolness that basically nobody but you can read this. The encryption key that was used to produce that value is stored in your user profile. Uh, it's, it's using an, uh, a part of Windows called the Data Protection API. And I'm, I gotta make sure I'm facing this way so you can actually hear me. Um, the Data Protection API is awesome. It's really, really convenient and easy to use. It's integrated with everything you can think of that needs to be protected in Windows. Um, the problem that you'll run into, and, and many of you probably are already familiar with this, is you can't share this value. This will only be able to be decrypted by your user account, and most of the time only on the same computer where you did it. So if I take, uh, oh by the way, I've set up a, uh, I've got a VM running on my machine to demonstrate what happens when you do different stuff here. And I've set up my session here so that when I do um, invoke command, it's automatically on another machine. So anytime you see, well, unless it times out, there we go. Um, so anytime I do invoke command there, it's just to show you what's going on. So if I say, well, first of all, if I say SS encrypted convert to secure string, this is that live demo thing, and to, to get secure string text, I can decrypt it on my machine. Now, if I try to do this, I'm not even going to bother with the get secure string text because it's not going to work anyway. If I try to do this on the remote computer, it's going to tell me key not valid for use in specified state. That's not a terribly user-friendly error message, but all that's telling me is I don't have the encryption key to be able to deal with that value on the remote computer because um, I'm not. It's a different user account and it's a different machine. <laughs> That's awkward, um, but this still has its use. It's, it's built in, it's very, very easy to use, and as long as you're okay with the limitations of you're encrypting something for yourself, um, so maybe you want to store something secret in your PowerShell profile or whatever, you're done. You, that's all you have to do. Incidentally, the, um, the other commandlets export CLIXML and import CLIXML, they use this exact same technique anytime they come across a secure string value. So in the, um, if I take my credential, Yes. I wonder if everybody knows how we using works. I don't know if that's general knowledge. Okay. Um, the, the, the using scope modifier here is something that was added in PowerShell version 3 uh, remoting, and it just it allows me to take variables that exist in my local session pass the, and use them in invoke command without having to do dash argument list and you know arg0 or a param block or anything like that. So um, PowerShell remoting will see that my script block has a, a variable with this using modifier, it will automatically serialize that, that variable locally and, and sort of inject some code to recreate it on the remote side before it runs the actual command that I sent. Um, so it's, it's just really a, a convenient way. It, it's more uh, user friendly to just type using and uh, go with your local variables. Um, so what was I about to do? Oh, export XML. So if I take my credential, and I put it in okay so I've got this XML that represents a PS credential object it has the username in plain text but this password field here which is going to be more of this kind of thing oh actually it may not be exactly the same thing because this looks like no it is okay so if I copy this and say, uh, whatever, enz equals paste, and I say enz convert to secure string, there we go. So that shows that it's, it, it's basically calling convert from secure string as part of the export CLI XML or the same code that it uses. So that's fine. If you are fine with the limitation of only using that value locally and as the same user account, fantastic. Now, the question that will inevitably come up next is, well, how do I encrypt something 
and how can I make it so that I'm able to use this on another computer or as local system or as a service account or whatever. And for a long time, the, the common answer to that was just encrypt the value on that computer as that account using this technique. It's a hassle, but once it's there, it's secure. You're not gonna leak your encryption keys uh, or whatever. Mm -hmm. However, the secure um, string commandlets do have some additional parameters here. You notice they have parameter sets that take a dash key or a dash secure key. Um, and these are both doing the same thing. It's just one is a secure string representation of a key, one is a byte array. What you're doing there is you're bypassing the data protection API that I mentioned earlier, and you're doing uh, AES encryption directly. Uh, AES is the sort of de facto uh, symmetric encryption algorithm today that, uh, that is the most secure option. So that, uh, that key byte array can take uh, either 16, 24, or 32 uh, element arrays because those are the valid key sizes for AES. And it works. If you do this, like if I say cred.password convert from secure string dash key 1 to 32, my ultra secure encryption key. Now I get another blob. Fantastic. Um, is that right? Yeah, sure. And if I, yeah, that's, that's base 64 now instead of the other representation. But the problem here is that all I've really done is move the target. Now instead of having to find my secret cred.password, all somebody has to know is 1 to 32, and they can decrypt my value too. So it, encryption, as it turns out, is easy. The hard part is protecting and storing your keys in a way that isn't stupidly easy to, to steal. So this works. It's not enough. It's not part of a whole crypto system that's going to make sure you're OK. And here's where I'm going to get into a little bit of the uh, crypto sort of programmer basics, uh, or maybe more than basics. I'm going to take EFS as an example, encrypting file system on Windows. As the end user, all you do is you walk up and you right click on a file and you say encrypt this file. And it works. And so it's very user friendly. But under the hood, the contents of the file get encrypted by a symmetric uh, key that's different for every file. That encryption key is encrypted then by one or more EFS certificates, depending on how many uh, users or groups you've chosen to share it with. The private mm -hmm. keys of those certificates are encrypted by Data Protection API. Data Protection API master keys are encrypted by another symmetric encryption key, which is derived from your logon credential. <laughs> so you've got this like, you know, seven or eight element long chain of, of wrapping layers of encryption. And I don't personally want to reinvent that wheel myself. I don't know if anybody in here would like to. No. Uh, but I mentioned in there the thing that you can do to kind of hop on that train, and that is certificates. Um, digital certificates in Windows already have built in the ability to protect and store your private keys. And you never even have to know what they are. So you generate a certificate or you get one from your CA or whatever, and you can use that in your code to encrypt with the public key and decrypt with your private key whatever secret it is that you want to uh, protect. And there's already a mechanism in place for moving those certificates around if you have to. You can export them, and uh, when you generate a PFX file, you password protect it so that the, the key is not stored in the clear. And people are already familiar with that. So without having to be a, you know, a security expert or a programmer or whatever, people can deal with saying, OK, I need to install this certificate before I can use this code. And anybody that doesn't have the certificate can piss off. So, that's what the, uh, the rest of the talk is going to be focused on. There are two techniques uh, that are okay. both fairly new. Sure. Yes, question. Can you use that with a service account that has denied local login property? If you want to. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I've tested that, but uh, you should, like anything that's running as a service, as long as the user profile gets loaded, then they'll have access to encryption key, uh, uh, private keys for certificates, and they can go from there. So there are two, two modules that are fairly new. They're from about the last year or so since uh, PowerShell version 5 preview has been uh, worked on and since I started to work on this topic as well. 
they were developed kind of in parallel. I didn't know that, uh, that PowerShell v5 was going to have the support when I started writing a, a similar module. But I'm going to kind of compare and contrast what their features are and, uh, and what the, <laughs> the caveats are. So there are uh, get command. These are the built-in commands that are available in PowerShell version 5 preview and also on the patched uh, server 2012 R2 and Windows 8.1 systems. They're, they've been uh, deployed with PowerShell version 4 in that case. Uh, CMS message. CMS is a standard uh, called, I believe, cryptographic message system or service or something syntax. like that. Syntax. Um, it's it's a standards-based thing. It's it, it looks a lot like what I was talking about before I started recording uh, with when you look at, say, a certificate file or an SSH private key or whatever, where you have begin CMS message and then a big X64 uh, or base 64 blob of text. The contents of that are defined out in a standard that I can't understand because it's crazy. But it's there, and uh, these commandlets will produce messages that are using that standard. So there's actually an opportunity for cross-platform stuff here. You can encrypt something in PowerShell and send it over to a Linux service, or vice versa. You can encrypt something in Linux as long as it knows how to produce CMS messages. So that's quite cool. And the interface for using these, uh, Is, is quite simple. You've got your two CMS message recipient. Now, that's not very self-documenting, but you can pass in a certificate object for that. I believe you can pass in an email address and it'll try to find a, a certificate with a matching subject. And there's a few other ways that you can get that. And then you can either encrypt a file with the path and literal path uh, parameters, or you can give it content and just pass in whatever you want. Um, and you can either dump the output to a file or let it come as output. So what I'm gonna do here, is I'm going to say <coughs> oh and by the way I have a um, let's see here I've prepared a certificate for this demo that's just CN equals demo and this happens to be a certificate that is usable in both modules so So we'll do that, and I will say CMS equals protect. Hey, what's GI short for for those who are not familiar? <laughs> GI is an alias for get item. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I do tend to use aliases a lot when I'm just typing commands, so I apologize. Um, <laughs> uh, ICM is invoke command, and uh, well, dir is get child item. So, so I say, in this case, I'll just say two dollar cert. I can just pass in my certificate object directly, and that's fine. And content is string. And the CMS looks like that. Like I said, it's uh, it, it probably looks very familiar if you've looked at these types of files before. It's just got a different header of begin CMS instead of begin you know SSH to public key or whatever. This is cool, and I can easily unprotect that. Uh, unprotect <coughs> CMS message dash content <coughs> CMS. I don't even have to tell it the certificate. It'll find the matching one if I have it somewhere. It'll grab the private key if I have it, and decrypt it for me and it's that easy um, that is completely at, well maybe not completely it's as secure <laughs> as you can make it um, the the private key of your certificate is protected in such a way that you pretty much have to own the box you have to get admin or system rights to be able to steal it and even then if you're using something like a smart card to log on and that sort of thing it, it might still be okay um, and I can show you here on my remote system put the same certificate out there and if I do what I want you to notice here is that I do not have the private key on the remote computer I do have it locally which is why I was able to decrypt that so now if I try to go on my remote system and say unprotect CMS message <coughs> content using CMS going to say, does not, oh, hang on a second, we'll just try it this way, dash two, cert, there we go, can't load the encryption certificate, does not, what?
That's not the error I expected to get. <laughs> Using remote cert. No, it's uh, remote cert is in the session. That's strange. Well, the the um, I don't have the private key over there, which is why it should be working. I'm I'm not sure why I'm getting a, an error other than what I wanted, but that's okay. There are some some down uh, some, some catches that you have to be aware of when you're using the CMS message commandlets. One is that they only really work on strings. Um, even though if I go back to my get command here, the the dash content parameter can take any old object, but what happens if you pass it something other than a string is it gets just like if I like see here if I say cred password and it shows me system .security .secure string internally the CMS message commandlet is going to take that text representation and encrypt that. So instead of encrypting my actual password, I'm going to get an encrypted representation of system.security.secure string. It caught me by surprise when I was testing, but that's the way it is. So if you want, now really secure strings are the only <coughs> tricky part to deal with there because you're going to have to take that secure string value and convert it back into text yourself. But that's where you can go back to the uh, convert from secure string dash key. It doesn't matter if that key happens to be well known because you're going to encrypt the resulting value anyway in CMS. So it, it, it's not hard to do, it's just a gotcha to be aware of. Um, other objects, uh, other than PS credentials and secure strings where you'd have to do that step, you can just do convert to CSV or um, export CLI XML or whatever you want to do to to produce a text representation of the object and then encrypt that and then you can always turn it back into an object later and you'll be okay. A little bit of extra work that you need to do uh, just to be aware of if you want to use these. The other module is the one that I wrote and it's called protected data and it has interfaces that are virtually identical as it turns out to CMS message so let's protect data It has an input object instead of a content, whatever. It has a certificate instead of a dash two. And it has a few other um, things that we don't have to uh, go into yet because they're, they're not related to certificates other than uh, use legacy padding that was to support some weird certificates that failed. Protect data works just about exactly like CMS except it doesn't produce standards based output. It produced amateur output. Um, it's, it's just a, a PowerShell custom object with all of the data that you need to be able to decrypt later except for that one private key. Um, so if I do, if I take my credential, and I do it just like that, <coughs> and I'll say encrypted equals, and I look at encrypt, whoops, encrypt, yeah, that's great variable naming on my part. Um, you get this PowerShell custom object, and in fact, I can do this to make it a little bit easier to read. So, ciphertext is the encrypted representation of the actual object that I put in, in this case, a PS credential. HMAC is an authentication code to make sure nobody's tampered with that before the decryption. Type just tells it what type it was so that when it reconstructs it later, it'll give you back a PS credential object. And then key data, you can have multiple recipients here, actually on both commands, you can say, for convert to, or for, for protect uh, CMS message, you can give multiple values to the dash two. Here you can give multiple values to the dash certificate, and then any one of those will be able to decrypt it. So you can share something with multiple people, uh, multiple certificates. In this case, for the demo, I'm only doing one. But if I say encrypted uh, key data, in this case there's only one, um, it shows the thumbprint of the certificate that was used to encrypt it, just helps to find the right key data later. Um, and then key, IV, are encrypted representations of the, the encryption uh, object that's necessary to decrypt ciphertext. So the same stuff is happening in CMS message. You just don't get to see it because it's in this nice standard blob instead of uh, being broken down into an object graph like this. But the experience to decrypt it is exactly the same. Just like with CMS message, you can just pipe it to unprotect data or you don't have to use the pipeline, but you don't have to specify a certificate. And if you don't, it'll just search for one on your machine. And as long as you've got the private key, it works. And now here, unlike with the CMS message, you actually get back a PS credential object. And I can say, 
can show that it's, it's actually a live object. So I didn't have to jump through any hoops to make that happen. Uh, protected data will support, by default, with, with no extra work on your part, um, strings, secure strings, and PS credential objects. Anything else that you want to encrypt, you either have to convert to a byte array or to a string, uh, whatever you know, method of serialization is your preference. But that way, it doesn't have to figure out which properties to actually persist and, and encrypt. Um, or how deep in the tree to go in terms of serialization. So the simple stuff is is really PS credentials. That's what people want most of the time. So, um, so that's that. And just like on the other one, if I say um, ICM Yep, no decryption certificate was found. If I say dash certificate remote search, it should say I cannot find the private key. So that's the cool thing. Now, what I can do, what I can demonstrate, is I can encrypt something on the remote computer because I have the public key. So I could distribute my certificate with just the public key. Somebody can encrypt something for me, and they won't be able to decrypt it, but they can send it to me, and I will. That's really the, the main, well... There's two use cases. You either want to encrypt something for yourself and decrypt it later, so you have the private key and you do both operations, or you send out your public key so somebody can send you stuff. People do this with like PGP and email and things like that, where you see people saying, here's my PGP public key, same, same use case. So if on my remote system I say SS equals whatever, and I say, Actually, I'll do it this way. Oops. There we go. So protected over here, same kind of object. Now, uh, again, on the remote system, in fact, I can, there we go, I'll just say using protected. Even though I encrypted it on the remote system, I still can't decrypt it over there. It was a one-way operation as far as that computer is concerned. On the local computer, it works fine. Uh, and I can... And that is... That's the module. Um, or rather, that's the certificate-based portion of it. It has some other features. Um, there's one other difference I do want to point out between the CMS message and protected data. Um, to my knowledge, the CMS message commandlets at this point do not support crypto next generation uh, certificates. So if you've used, say, a Microsoft CA to issue a certificate and you choose a version 3 template, I believe by default that uses a, a, a next generation key storage provider. It, when I tested this a little while ago, it, it did not work. It couldn't find that private key. Uh, the protected data module has some code to handle CNG, so you can use uh, elliptic curve certificates if you want to play with the new stuff. Uh, or you can just use RSA that happens to use a next generation key storage provider. Uh, but aside from that, they're just about the same. There's, there's some information that you might want to know about um, the certificates that you need to use for both these modules. There's a requirement for the uh, CMS message commandlets. In fact, I'm just going to do this. Da, 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 da. Bring up my demo cert here. To use a certificate with the CMS module, it has to have an enhanced key usage property of document encryption. Um, and one thing that they've added in version 5 to go along with this is if I do cert, there's a new dynamic parameter dash document encryption cert to help you find them on the system, just like there's one for uh, dash code signing cert. Um, so that's a nice way to identify. But unfortunately, new self-signed certificate, the commandlet, um, not only does it not let you stick the, uh, the document encryption thing on there yet, although that would be a nice feature, I believe it also creates that version 3 next generation uh, key storage, so it wouldn't work anyway. <laughs> so there, there are some examples out there, blog posts, of people that have started to play with this, and they've got um, like uh, cert rec.inf files uh, templated that you can use. Also, in the, uh, in the protected data module, there is a a testutils.ps1 file 
which has a function in here for doing the same thing. So, uh, come on, there we go. New test certificate, and it has some print. It's it's used to generate certificates in my unit tests, but it can um, well it, it automatically includes the document encryption um, enhanced key usage here. So this is the part that you would need to put in your INF file. And if you want to, you can grab that function and use it to generate your own certificates as well. Uh, just make sure that when you call it, your certificate type is RSA and not any of these other things because they're all crypto next generation stuff that won't work. And that's the default value anyway. Um, for the protected data module, the requirement is that the key usage extension, it depends on what certificate type you have. If it is an RSA certificate, whether it's next generation or not, it has to have the key encipherment key usage. And if you're using a uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman certificate, it has to have the key agreement usage extension. And those are there so that the problem with this is that you can generate certificates that are only valid, only valid for generating digital signatures. And there's no way to tell that that's the case when you have the public copy of the certificate. That information is only on the private key. So these extensions, this key usage is, is there as a hint to tell you that this is a certificate that you'll actually be able to decrypt something with later. And with that, uh, are there any questions? We've got about uh, 15 minutes. Does that, that get secure screen command you're using, is that a casting command or is that work? Uh, it's, it's just a function, it's, it's a wrapper, like the .NET framework lets you convert secure strings into strings. Um, and what I will do here is I'll just show you <coughs> This is the, the function. So it's it's in the system.runtime.interruptservices.marshall class. So you need to call two functions. One is convert the secure string into some kind of unmanaged um, string buffer. In this case, I used global alloc unicode. Um, and then there's another corresponding function to convert that unmanaged string back into a managed string. In this case, it's pointer to string unicode. Um, and then you want to be sure to, to free up that unmanaged buffer or you get a memory leak. So instead of having to type that code every time I want to turn a secure string into a string, I just stick that function in my profile. And do you have that available somewhere? Yes, and actually I've got another module. Um, let me find it here. It's, whoops. Can't you also use the get network credential method.net method? You can, yeah. Um, if you're dealing with a PS credential object, if you've just got a bare secure string, then you'd have to create one, and that was more hassle than I wanted to do. Um, so somewhere in my GitHub, I think I've shared this. I could be wrong. <laughs> okay, I've, I've got it's it's out in the Technic gallery. There's a module called I think Secure String Functions or Secure Strings or something like that. And what I wrote was a proxy function for convert from secure string that adds dash as plain text dash force that does exactly this. But um, I will also publish this function just as is. I'll stick it on its own GitHub repository later today. Um, any other questions? Did, did you yes. say that was available in version four two? Backported, or was it just <coughs> simply version five? For the module. CMS message commandlets? Your module. Oh, my module is compatible back to PowerShell version two. That's what I thought. Um, so I guess that's that's another contrast between the two. The CMS message, the, the techniques that they use may be compatible back, but I don't know. I haven't tried it, so um, it depends on what what was in the .NET framework uh, two and three point five, whether they go back to PowerShell two or not. I know that they're only distributed right now with PowerShell version 4 with the patch or PowerShell version 5. Can you show people how you use an ICM to automatically connect to a particular computer? Sure. I, <laughs> I set this up before it started, but um, here, in fact, I will I'll open up this file here. So I set up a new PS session, and then I just stuck it in PS default parameter values so that this is something that's a technique that's available since uh, PowerShell version three, where instead of having to pass this dash session dollar s every single time I ran invoke command, I set it in this hash table of global PS default parameter values. When I call the invoke command command, the session parameter automatically pass in dollar s unless I've overwritten that and passed in something else. So it just made it less for me to type. 
questions, questions? We've got 10 minutes. We could just leave and go drink or something. Did you say that test details? Yes. Oh, that was in my protected data module. There's, uh, I'll give a link to it um, on the PowerPoint slide. I guess I could bring that up here, but um, out on GitHub. So github.com slash dlwyatt slash protected data. Um, this is where you'll have, that. I mean, this has many more files than what's in the actual distribution, uh, including all my unit tests and certificates and stuff that are used, but there's a testutils.ps1 file in there as well. Um, so let me let me bring up my my PowerPoint again, just so that we can get through the end of the, the slides here. Whoops. There we go. So let's wait for the projector. There we go. So the protected data module. There's the the link to the uh, source if you want to contribute to it or request new features or whatever. That's the place to do it. The module itself is published on PowerShell GET, so you can just run install module uh, protected data and that'll work. The second link here, crypto101.io, is awesome material if you want to learn to write this sort of code yourself. Um, if you just want to use protected data or CMS message, you don't have to worry about it, but it was a big help for me in writing the module and, and understanding what the potential attacks on encryption are, You know how, how I might have screwed up in writing my code so that, uh, um, as an example, the original version of protected data didn't have that message authentication code. And I didn't know that you could take an encrypted AES message and fiddle with the bits and actually cause it to do something that you intended it to do on the decryption stage. It's really funky. That kind of information is in a free book that comes from crypto101.io. And there's contact information for me up there, email or Twitter, uh, if you want to get in touch about anything else. And then there's the boilerplate, thank you, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so the CMS message to Mm -hmm. um, that just goes to a certificate that's the main parameter there? Yes, it, it has to be able to find a certificate from whatever value you pass in. Honestly, I'm not sure exactly all of the ways you can do that. I know you can pass an email address. I know you can pass a certificate object the way I showed. I think maybe you can give it just a thumbprint yeah. or a, like a cert colon slash whatever that kind of path. <laughs> or a file system path if it resolves to a cert on your drive as well. Okay, and actually protected data does a lot of the same things. You can give it file system paths, certificate drive paths, thumbprints. Um, I tend to personally just get the actual certificate object and pass those in out of habit, but it works either way. So this is going to sound kind of remedial, but people are using this these techniques to basically secure credentials and passing it between machines and objects, and, and yep. so hey. I'm releasing this code and it needs this cert and so or needs these credentials and I don't want to give them to somebody else. Okay. Or that's that's the scenario I talked about at the beginning where if you want your code if you want to be able to distribute your code, use a secret value but not reveal it to the person that's running the code, you cannot give them the certificate. The the decryption and the use of that secret has to happen somewhere else. So maybe you set up a custom PowerShell remoting endpoint that handles that or a GIA endpoint. Uh, maybe you set up a web service that you know you give them an API key, but the actual credential is used from your web server, that sort of thing. But if the information is decrypted locally by the user that's running the script, you just gave them your secret. They've got everything they need. Dave, yes. Could could you uh, just have them run the script as a run as account and have that run as account um, have uh, a profile local on the machine that can distribute by PowerShell? So, for example, if I have 100 machines that I want my 11 IT people to run scripts without being able to see what's in them, um, then I could give them a nice account. But prior, I would, by ICM, go to uh, all of these machines with, IC, with, with a run as account and, and leave a profile there so it be able to decrypt it. Would that be viable? Okay. When you say a run as account, do you mean that they're actually going to type like run as slash user whatever, or are you talking about a remoting endpoint with the run as account? Yeah, not a remoting endpoint. So they run the script with the run as account. So okay. There's really no difference. If they have access to another account that has the encryption key, it's just like having it in their own account. They, okay. um, so yeah, if, if, if they have the password to that account, they can do it. The difference with using a PowerShell remoting endpoint is that you can authorize and, and uh, authenticate the, the user's own account but then have it run as something else. So the run as credential of the end, remoting endpoint is never given to the user. They don't have to know it. They shouldn't know it. 
Um, and then you can use that account to protect your secrets. One good example of a scenario, I, I was hearing the other day about this person who <coughs> was writing uh, some module, not a PowerShell module, I think it was Python or something, and he wanted to connect up, it was dealing with uh, Amazon EC2 or something, accidentally checked in his API key, said whoops, fixed it like three minutes later. Two weeks later, he gets a bill from Amazon because <laughs> bots are scraping GitHub nonstop for API keys. They spun up this big cluster of machines and started doing Bitcoin mining with it with a, <laughs> a two minute whoops. So what you can do with this kind of module is um, check in the credential as, as an encrypted. So you, you have the private key on all the machines that should be able to decrypt it and run it. You would encrypt it with the public key. So what you check into GitHub, source control, whatever, you don't have to worry about rotating these things, is just the version that's encrypted. So one of these bots, they could pull it down, but they wouldn't be able to decrypt it since they don't have the private key. They only have the, the public content. So it's a safe way to put credentials into source control without worrying that people that you don't trust can actually decrypt the content and start doing Bitcoin farms. Yeah. <laughs> if, if anybody's interested, here's my PowerShell Get API key. Have fun. <laughs> this is what's in my, I distribute with my profile. It's encrypted with protected data. If you don't have my certificate, yeah, good luck. <laughs> so that's that's the kind of thing that I wrote that module for. Um, yes? So have you tried to apply this particularly to DSC when we've got all this uh, configuration data, database yeah. paths, things like that that we want to encrypt? It's not necessarily encrypted credential that's handled by the model. So how yeah. would you handle encrypting configuration data. There's actually an example of this. The question was, can we apply this technique or these techniques to DSC and configuration data? Um, out on PowerShell.org are the DSC tooling modules that Stephen Murawski wrote uh, when he was at Stack Exchange, and we've made some changes to those. But I can show you here. Uh, Z, DC. Another cool module, Z Location by uh, Sergey at Microsoft, is a, a port of a Linux tool, but. It, it remembers the directories you've been in and uh, just jumps there. It's it's like reading your mind. It's great. All right. So and in fact, hey, I'm in, I'm even in the right place. Um, so in in here, one of these files. Let's do convert from encrypted file. It actually uses the protected data module in the latest. Uh, Code. So it, it reads this hash file, uh, hash table PowerShell data file, and in here, <coughs> oh, hang on. This is the master branch, not the development branch. No? That's odd. Well, I'm not going to spend too much time hunting around there. there. There's calls to protected data from in there somewhere, but I think I was looking at an old version of the file. Um, so yes, you, you can use these to protect, like if you're storing your configuration data in source control, you can do that, and the DSC configuration module already does that if you're using Steve's tooling. All right. And with that, we're at 9.43, so I guess I will just push the button and uh, send this up to YouTube. Thank you.